Hey guys, it's Goosebumps Completionist, and welcome back to Goose Junkies. Today's episode, we decided to do this kind of last minute because there's so many things going on in the kids' horror subgenre right now. We thought we'd just share with you all what's going on, what's being released, and what to look out for. Uh, we're also going to be talking about some of our favorite kids' horror IPs outside of Goosebumps, or at least books that we have found, maybe in knockoffs or other series. So stay tuned for that as well. Tonight, we are joined by regular panelists, including myself. I'm the host, uh, but it's good to see uh, Ultimate Goosebumps Man back on the panel. How are you doing tonight, Ultimate Goosebumps Man? Eh, I'm good. Had a busy weekend. Have a ho- I had swamped with homework, and I still have more, But and I have something tonight. But <laughs> uh, It's all good. It's all good. Um, we're joined by Goosebumps Enthusiast now. Uh, how are you doing tonight, Bruce? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, despite the name change, I hope everything's still the same. And yeah, I'm really excited to do our first discussion video. It's going to be awesome. Oh, it's going to be awesome. And then we have the man, the myth, the Chicago legend, BD Horror. How are you doing tonight, BD? Yo, 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 people of the night, it's Emperor Palpatine. I'm off no sleep. I look like I'm off that Zaza. And I'm glad to talk about Goosebumps knockoffs, as long as it's not Shingle or P-Bumps which I'm glad that it's not tonight, so God bless. <laughs> oh, man, that's a whole other discussion for another day. One um, day. <laughs> but uh, I think we can start off this video just by sharing some of our favorite kids' horror stories that we've come across the outside of Goosebumps. And like I said in the intro, these can be in knockoffs or in other series or whatever the case may be, uh, some of your favorites that you've come across. Um, and I'll throw it to whoever wants to take the floor first and share what they like or, or are very interested in. Uh, whoever wants to take it first. Well, um, I guess I'll start and just talk about two books that I have read somewhat recently that I actually highly recommend. They might not be perfect, but these two books right here, both book number 12 in their respective series. Uh, first off... We got Dead Time Stories, Welcome to the Terror Go Round. I, once again, highly recommend this. This is a really fun one. Uh, involves, like, some pretty serious stuff, surprisingly, like uh, circus freaks and, like, deformities in, like, labor, uh, slavery even. Like, not, like, a uh, racist way, but, like, it does go some places that you never would expect a book like this to do. Uh, not like The Bog Girl. Don't worry. But this is a really fun book that I just kind of flew through a little while back. And yeah, the cover, I don't think it can live up to that because that is awesome. But it does definitely uh, do it at least a little bit of justice. Um, I had fun with it. I'd probably give it like an 8 out of 10 or so. Uh, another one that I read actually quite recently is this one right here called Night of the Living Clay in the Bone Chiller series. Now, this is actually my first uh, Bone Chillers book, and this was uh, right after um, this book, which is when Betsy Haynes retired from the series. So this is actually written by a guy named David, but he has a great fill-in from what I know. I haven't read any of the Betsy Haynes books, but this was a really fun book. I really like the characters. The story feels like monster blood, but just better, honestly. I would highly recommend this again. I'd say, what, 8.5 out of 10? Uh, sadly, this one's a little bit rare. I got it for a good deal. But if you can get this, uh, definitely do so. I, I highly recommend both of these, actually. So, yeah. No, book number 12 in these two series is, are awesome. Great picks, Bruce. I have never read either one of those. So I'm curious to see what those are about. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I mean... Uh, if you ever want to make reviews on those, that'd be good to see. So yeah, to what, I'll do that soon, yeah. All right. Um, Ultimate Goosebumps, man, what do you have to share? Um, well, for books, um, I don't actually have the physical books on me right now, so I'm using the steelbook copy as an alternative. But Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. This is one of my favorite childhood series. Scared the ever-loving crap out of me. <laughs> and... You know, illustrations, iconic. The, Stephen Gamel's illustrations are just awesome in every way. And, like, genuinely some of the scariest stuff you will ever see as a child. 
And some of them are still the reason I sleep with my head under the covers as an adult. So, <laughs> um, mainly just from habits, but, uh, yeah, just great artwork, especially as an artist myself, I can really appreciate all the work he does and all just the details and the elaborate, just how, how surreal and scary Gamel got away with in these books is insane. The stories are fine, but again, the, the illustrations really are what stand out. There's some good stories in there, like Harold and the Dream and some of those ones. And of course, it later got adapted to the movies, which or the movie. <laughs> and I think that's one of the best like kids horror movies I've seen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, scary stories to tell in the dark. Alvin Schwartz. Have you ever read like the special, the thick special edition treasury versions where they have like the uh, information about, you know, his life and what he was taking inspiration from? The man basically turned urban legends into like child sort of friendly stories for them to like get incorporated with. And I, I, as, as a connoisseur of like urban legend stuff, and I've always been interested in that, Scary Stories has always been that outlet for that medium of the kids' horror genre. And I definitely think the movie, as we said before we got on the podcast, is what Goosebumps 2015 should have been with a handful of some of the better books. It could have been that scary in a PG-13 kind of way. But, you know, Sony and, I don't know, families... I guess they're taking into consideration for it. Uh, but, you know, nonetheless, uh, yeah, great pick. Great pick. And also, I have another I, I, one, too, that I was going to bring up. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's a movie. It's not a book, but it is the 2023 Haunted Mansion. Now, I am a diehard fan of the ride. It's my favorite ride in all of Disney. I have, like, I, can, I have little mini figures in the back here. I have a blanket on my bed of it. Like, I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> and that movie was something I was so excited for. Because, ah, oh, nice, Hatbox Ghost. I have some, yeah, I have some other stuff as well. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I was so excited for that movie when it was announced at, like, D23 in, I believe, 2022 it was announced. And I was very disappointed with the Eddie Murphy movie. It's not horrible, but it, you know, doesn't really capture the ride very well. And so I was really excited when I saw this one being made by diehard fans of the ride. Like, the director loved the ride. He even worked on it for a while. And just seeing how much love and care they put into adapting the ride into the movie. You get to see, like, you know, the mansion itself is a recreation of the ride in Disneyland. You see, like, the stretching room. The Hatbox Ghost is the main villain. You know, there's just so much love and care put into it to make it feel like a fan, a movie for the fans of the ride. And I think it was just a really well-written movie. The characters are all fun, especially the Keith Stanfield. That guy killed it in that role. And, yeah, I just love it. It's one of my favorite movies, and it gets so much unnecessary crap, and I don't ever understand why. <laughs> you know, that's honestly one of my favorite modern, like, family horror movies to come out in, like, the past ten years. Like, I'll put it easily in my top five. Um, just because of the quality of it, measured up to everything else. And even then, when you compare this, like, to the 2003 movie, it's almost like... The 2003 movie was kind of like a Goosebumps episode reimagining of what the ride was. And then you get a more faithful to, to the source material adaptation in the new movie. And I think the new movie definitely is scarier and is definitely made more so in the spirit of that ride. And I, I, I'm i there with you. It's one of my favorite Disney World. And I've never been to Disneyland, but I go to the Haunted Mansion every time I go to Disney World. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I but totally I will understand. say, in the 2003 movie, the zombie scene is terrifying. <laughs> the zombie scene is awesome in that movie. Oh, but. yeah, totally. Totally. Um, yeah, great picks, great picks. Uh, BD Horror, uh, what do you have to bring for this uh, segment of discussion? There's quite a few things I could probably talk about. Uh, first of all, let's just get addressed. Scary Stories of Tell in the Dark is the only kids horror media that scarred me as a child. Again, Stephen Gamel's artwork. It's absolutely fantastic. It could send nightmares to even adults. And there's a lot of stories in there that are very memorable to me. In a way, this was creepypasta before creepypasta became what it is. Urban legends being told in a popular medium, kind of advertised towards younger audiences. You have stories like the Wendigo. You have somebody fell from a loft. You have that one story dealing with poltergeist. You have Harold. There's a lot of scary stuff in there. 
And I do agree that the movie is a better version of Goosebumps 2015, which actually leads me to another movie that I'll be covering later um, in my picks that I think is also a better version of 2015's Goosebumps. But in terms of books, um, I have to give a big shout out to one of my favorite kids horror books that I ever read that's from a knockoff series, which is Spine Tingler's Billy Baker's Dog Won't Stay Buried. That book to me felt like I was watching a movie. It reminds you a lot of the Pet Cemetery kind of stuff. It has a lot of action in it. It's pretty brutal, pretty creepy, has some emotional stuff in there. And the final chapter in that book is probably one of the most realistic things that I've seen in terms of twists for a book. And the ending involving the dog is nightmare fuel. Imagining that scene till this day still scars me in a little bit, uh, especially when you get the imagery of stuff like Smile Dog. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Smile Dog, that JPEG. This is kind of what the ending scene alludes to um, in terms of something. So very creepy. Um, I also want to give a shout out to uh, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Because I've read one book from them, and that book was also really great to me, which is The Tale of the Restless House. The Tale of the Restless House is basically a story about a haunted mansion, but it ends up becoming a combination of time travel, parallel worlds, and Monster House, the animated movie. And it kind of all wraps it up into one package. So it feels like you're watching a higher budget Are You Afraid of the Dark movie. You get a lot of action scenes and tense moments. And if you love Monster House, you're going to like the homages that it pays with this book. And I'm currently reading another book, which is my final pick, which is a Bone Chillers book as well. So shout out to Soda. Uh, I'm reading Teacher Creature. And Teacher Creature, so far, I'm close to finishing it. It feels very much like a Goosebumps book, but it has a lot more action. First of all, it starts off with kids daring each other to stay in an abandoned school during a freaking hurricane. Yeah, a hurricane tearing apart the town that all the adults evacuated. And there's potentially a swamp monster that is basically playing a creature feature slasher role. Uh, hunting them down, freaking them out, and it's described as having like blood all over its mouth, slimy skin, uh, haunting them in the shadows. Uh, pretty intense. And finally, I'm going to give a little shout out to a movie that's better than Goosebumps 2015. Sorry, Goosebumps 2015 fans, but Zathura. Zathura, I think, is a kid's movie that has some horror aspects to it, and it has adventure. It has an emotional aspect to it with the main characters. You got awesome monsters in it. You have that killer robot. You have the Zorgons. The Zorgons are one of the most dope villains I've probably seen in kids' films. And they're very intense. That scene with the furnace and the little boy and that little dumbwaiter, very creepy. Freaked me out. And you got a lot of badass fight scenes and stuff like that. I could have done without that weird sister relationship with the... uh brother if you know you know but i'm not gonna get in that but aside from that it's a dope movie and i think it's better than 2015 and even jumanji in a way because i think the idea is creative it takes a board game involves space aliens robots this is super dope to me so those would be my picks great picks and you had a lot i, I mean i have five myself but uh <laughs> um i like that you mentioned Zathura because Zathura was kind of like my generation's Jumanji, because when Jumanji came out, I was maybe like two years old. So, like, getting Sathura and seeing that in the theaters was a special thing. Uh, Billy Baker's Dog, great book. Uh, I have not read Teacher Creature, but there is an episode in Bone Chillers of Teacher Creature um, that I'm kind of morbidly curious about. So I might do that eventually, just from your recommendation. Uh, and, of course, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, iconic. We've already covered that. Soda, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, not especially. Though, what actually just sparked inside my head is, did you guys know how um, usually the knockoff series take lots of elements from Goosebumps, or even, heck, sometimes just take the names almost completely direct, like, extremely obvious, basically. Well, actually, Goosebumps knocked off a knockoff, because... Uh, teacher creature came before the series 2000 book creature teacher so actually bone killers uh was actually knocked off by goosebumps for once so that's really interesting i don't know i wonder how yeah, they i wonder I, I wonder if the ghost writers that are associated with goosebumps that are currently known were kind of 
working together maybe with Betsy Haynes Ghost Riders. There is some speculation that that could have been the case, but um, yeah, I've always thought that there are some funny nods between the franchises, especially in the 90s ones with how similar the titles can be. Um, yeah, Teacher Creature is definitely a mouthful when you're trying to think about Creature Teacher from Series 2000, of course. Um, but yeah, great points. Great points, everyone. I guess I'll share mine. Um, if you know me, I've, I mentioned this movie. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. It's not for everyone, but it's easily one of my favorite kids' horror stories ever made, Monster House. Monster House, I know BD already mentioned it. Um, it's just a timeless film for me. This was a movie that I saw 14 times in the theater when I was a kid. I rode my bike, cut through the woods, back back in like the mid-2000s, which it wasn't that dangerous to do, but given the, the, you know, the dangers that could be out lurking in the woods, you know, you got your homeless people, your meth addicts and all that, I definitely probably crossed paths with. I'm shocked that my parents let me do that, but I saw it 14 times, saw it in a 3D a couple times. As soon as it came on a DVD, I had bought the DVD and I've had this DVD for a long time. Um, the, the plot is just where it gets me. It's just a simple Halloween story with a creative flair, uh, with a house that comes to life that might be possessed like a poltergeist kind of way. And these kids have to save whoever's been put into the house. And the creators are actually people that I really come to enjoy a lot from like Dan Harmon, the creator of, uh, Rick and Morty. He wrote the movie along with Rob Schraub, and Rob Schraub created the sitcom Community, and he also wrote a couple of episodes from Creepshow. Most famously, he wrote the episode called Public Television of the Dead, which happens to be my favorite Creepshow segment of all time. And he wrote Monster House, so that's awesome. <laughs> so, in case you didn't know that. Um, and I think Robert Zemeckis directed the movie? Or Steven Spielberg? It was one of them, I think. Robert, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely, he, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was, you know, it's it's not everybody's style of animation, but holy crap, I, I just love the movie. So, did you want to have it, uh, add anything to that? Uh, I'm really sorry to interrupt. I cannot believe I forgot this. I have this, like, handy, too. I forgot about Scooby-Doo uh, 1, the movie. I cannot believe I forgot this. Uh, besides books, this is an amazing, uh, like, kids' horror uh, movie, I guess, because... It just has, everything is great here. Everything just clicks. Um, although it's super corny in a lot of spots, you know, <laughs> the the jokes kind of go a little far, but I really like the characters. Uh, the moments that are creepy actually do kind of creep you out. Sometimes not uh, intentionally, like when the girl's face is all stretched, but, you know, it works for what it was. And I think this came out in, what, I think 2002. So for the time... I'd say that this is probably one of my favorite kids' horror films. Uh, my favorite probably being When Good Ghouls Go Bad, which was fantastic. But, yeah, just wanted to mention that. I forgot. Sorry. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't mention When Good Ghouls Go Bad, given the, the glowing review you gave it on the, the previous podcast episode. Oh, I already, I already yeah. gave my fair share on the last episode. I think I'm okay. <laughs> and adding on to Scooby 2002 as well, like, Matthew Lillard, the man is awesome as Shaggy. Like, he was so good that he went on to voice the character from 2010 to modern day. <laughs> yeah, he's he's perfect as Shaggy. Like, a great replacement for Fred Willard. I mean, I think that's who voiced Shaggy before. Um, no, it was um, Casey Kasem. Casey Kasem. I always get Frank them two confused. Is Fred. They look almost identical. That's why I can never... Yeah. But Casey Kasem, he was a great voice actor. And Matthew Lillard, I think perfects Casey Kasem's role. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, thanks for adding that, Bruce. Um, going back to mine, you might know this is one of my all-time favorite kids' horror episodes. Uh, we have The Tale of Vampire Town from Are You Afraid of the Dark? That's another one of my favorite ones. If only because it feels like Goosebumps <laughs> and it's in Are You Afraid of the Dark. I'm not going to lie. I'm not a big fan of Are You Afraid of the Dark story setups a lot of the time. I don't like hunky, how hunky-dory they can be and how kumbaya they can feel but this story actually has some gall to it it has a memorable protagonist probably one of the greatest kids horror protagonists ever uh, i can gush about this forever the, the plot is kind of simple but that's kind of why i love it too it doesn't overstay its welcome um it has a dark twist to it and it's funny and the monster design is pretty creepy and for the time i think this came out in like 1999 in the revival era of the show 
this is like right up there with like the tale of the secret admirer which is more like pseudo young adult but since it's in this show i can kind of group it in as some of my favorite episodes from the entire series and possibly even kids horror television so i have to tip my hat to this story but these three are easily my favorite books in no particular order uh monster street carnival this is a modern kids horror series it only lasted four books sadly before J.H. Reynolds had to pull the series because the publisher didn't want to make any more. This is a fantastic emotional story about a Halloween carnival. A Halloween carnival. I mean, it's just so atmospheric. Um, there are so many twists and turns, emotional moments, and it's more of like a coming-of-age story. It's not like Goosebumps because it's so serious, but I'll tell you what, there is some gripping storytelling in this and there's a villain that's actually absolutely terrifying and i have to commend jh reynolds for writing this beautiful book here but my two absolute favorite books are actually the only two by this one author and i think they're both really fun it's killer computer and attack the living mask written by robert hirschfeld in my opinion robert hirschfeld even though he only ever wrote two kids horror books he's honestly my favorite kids horror writer outside of rl stein and that's saying a lot on just two books to, uh, to measure here. Choose Your Own Nightmare, Attack of the Living Mask is a fun, short, and sweet Choose Your Own Adventure story. A lot of things in this book would never fly. Well, maybe in Give Yourself Goosebumps, but holy crap, some of these scenes in here were actually legitimately terrifying. And there's crazy Im imagery with illustrations in this. And it's just the epitome of a Halloween read to me. It's perfect for what it is. But Killer Computer is honestly... Next to Werewolf Skin is my all-time favorite kids' horror book. If you want to listen to my review of this, I have a full review on the channel where I gush over this book. It's an absolute masterpiece. It's an absolute masterpiece. And BD, you have to read this book. I'm telling you. You're going to see why this book is so great. I think Zippy, honestly, is up there in my all-time favorite kids' horror villains. I mean, he's just insane. And it's it's surprisingly emotional. It ends on a really good note before it overstays its welcome. And yeah, it's just essentially a, a perfect story, in my opinion, from start to finish. Yeah, if you all like want to like send me that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Killer Computer, you can get it really cheap online. Same thing with this. You can go on Thrift Books and get a hardcover of this for like four bucks. I mean, if you really wanted it. So send so. me a link for a uh, Killer Computer. I find that one to be really rare. So yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um which I think we all had good picks. And I think that kind of lends the spirit that Goosebumps, while they're still coming out these days with a new series called House of Shivers, there, there always has been some peripheral side kids horror IPs trying to make a name for themselves. And you have these authors putting a stab in the effort and trying to get books self-published or taking to a publisher. Some have stood... A, stood past the four book curse some of them are kind of struggling some of them have been successful but i i bring this to attention because this is kind of like a new segment because 2024 we have a lot of kids horror coming out and i think that for the first time and i can say maybe since 2015 when the goosebumps movie came out originally that we have a new competition bubble boom going on uh, and i think a lot of it has to deal with the 2023 goosebumps show kind of bringing in the competition and making people like, okay, they're coming out with the show. Let's get things rocking. And I know a lot of you don't keep up with this because you're not kids horror nerds like I am, but I have a whole stack of stuff we can discuss because there's a lot coming out. And you can see, this is a lot of stuff, y'all. This is not nothing here. Um, and I think maybe we can start with the Goosebumps stuff coming out or Arl Stein because that's what, the audience is probably most used to um we can start with house of shivers house of shivers they uh put out book one scariest book ever recently it's gotten a lot of great reviews um coming up soon this year we have two new books that have currently been announced we have goblin monday and night of the living mummy which is a play on night of the living dummies title from the og 62 and i have to say um this new marketing scheme they have going on with house of shivers is framed like classic books. No longer is there subsidiary side stories like in Horrorland or connecting story arcs. No longer is there random narrator bits or opening characters like the Crypt Keeper knockoff or Arl Stein himself introducing the books. This is just cut and dry goosebumps again. 
And I want to hear your thoughts about House of Shivers. Do you think that this series is a good direction to be going with modern Goosebumps? Uh, I haven't read it personally, but I'm really excited to read it. Um, I'm very happy to learn about this. You've already uh, told me privately that this is basically just the OG books once again. I mean, almost everything looks similar. Even the art style is somewhat similar. I mean, not as, like, exact, but it's a lot more similar than, like, Brandon Dorman for sure. The old logo is coming back. A lot of stuff is just kind of reminiscing, I guess, um, over the 90s original series. And that's really cool, I think. And I bet that this is one of the most, like, best-selling Goosebumps books in a really long time. Not even just because of the new show, but also because I went to, like, Barnes & Noble one day to see if they had it. And they had nothing. Like, apparently, they just kept selling out. So that's impressive. If a Goosebumps book uh, can sell out this many times at a Barnes & Noble, and it's been out for how long now? That was only, like, a month ago. That's really impressive. And I hope that uh, the hype continues because, uh, yeah, like you said, Goblin Monday is coming out, which looks really interesting. <laughs> Uh, Night of the Living Mummy, I saw Mr. Mortman, uh, the YouTuber, commented on Completionist Post actually saying that it looked like a graveyard school book, which is so cool. It looks like Slime Lake. Do y'all know what that is? I don't yeah. know, but it looked a lot like that book cover, and I'm really excited to read them. I don't, I don't read moderns, but I'm going to pick these up if I can. So yeah, really excited. Yeah, I do think that the marketing on the covers has gotten a little bit better. No offense to Brandon Dorman. He was a long-standing Goosebumps artist, and he did some fantastic covers for this series. I don't mean any disrespect to the man. But I do feel that having a new artist going along with the new font was a good move in the sense that you can now distinguish these books from the past four series. Going back to the old logo, I think was a great idea. And having Robert Ball, who I think has made three phenomenal covers. And I know a lot of people have given backlash to the title of Night of the Living Mummy and the cover. But I love all three of his cover works. I mean, they're great and they, they're they captivating. Um, does anybody else have any have anything to add on about House of Shivers? Yeah. I, I mean, gonna... it's... Oh, you can go. You can go. <laughs> okay. I was going to say that uh, in terms of the new series, one of my biggest complaints about modern books was making sequels to books that did not need sequels. And especially with Slappy World basically tainting my love, well, my mid-love of Slappy, with having so many books of him coming out that were subpar. Seeing House of Shivers making standalone books is one of my favorite things to see, because I was always a fan, especially in the old series, of books like Calling All Creeps, Werewolf Skin, How I Learned to Fly, Cuckoo Clock of Doom, that were standalones. And they stood out for their unique ideas and the fact that they weren't tied to any franchise. So seeing these standalone books come back, make me more excited and I'm additionally excited because of the fact that Stein seems to be taking subpar ideas that he didn't execute well before and trying to make them better because the whole idea of scariest book ever was that even though I haven't read it everyone says it's like Legend of the Lost Legend which is a hated book I mean just look at Completionist's thumbnail on the review it's a hated book and then it turns out being a much better story and execution with scariest book ever Obviously, Goblin Monday, you get some ideas of uh, lawn gnomes, kind of like a better version of that, I'm hoping. And Night of the Living Mummy, actually, when I heard the story premise, immediately popped within my mind a Haunting Hour episode about a mummy. And that Haunting Hour episode had a very similar idea to this book. Um, That episode was mid. It was fine, decent. So if Stein's able to make something great out of this, uh, I'd be very excited. And by the way, that uh, Night of Living Mummy cover is awesome. The statues of Anubis and Horus in the back looking ominous, and then the mummy with the reaching out for the pendant is a super dope cover. So overall, I think this is the right direction that Goosebumps needs to go into. Great, great points, man. Uh, so do you have something you want to add on? Uh, I just wanted to say that I already mentioned this in the Discord a little while back, but I'm hoping we can actually review these on the podcast. Like, I think that'd be really yeah. cool to... Uh, you know, compared to some other Goosebumps books, like like people were saying, Legend of the Lost Legend, 
versus scariest book ever. How about we do that one uh, sometime? I don't know when, but if these books consistently feel like similar to other Stein books, we can do that. Or if they don't, we can, like BD said, kind of compare like the Mummy one to Haunted Hour. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I'm totally down happens. for that. I think I think um, spreading awareness about the new series, I think, is is a really cool thing, and uh, you know, keeps everybody up to date of what's coming out. Because there's, to be honest, I don't think a lot of people keep up with all this stuff, and a lot of it's buried and kind of niche, put on Amazon or you know, they're out in bookstores, but there's like no marketing to them. So it's kind of important to use this as a jumping off point to sh direct people to these kind of stories. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm totally down for that. Ultimate, do you have any ideas about uh, the House of Shiver series? Not really, just because I haven't really followed much up with it, because <laughs> Modern Goosebumps just isn't really my thing, and I'm focusing more on the classic stuff right now. But I'm interested to see it, because I've heard good things about the first book, so... I definitely want to check it out at some point, and I will whenever we cover it for the podcast. So I'm curious about it for sure. Yeah, and uh, just to let everyone know, the release date of Goblin Monday is March 5th, 2024. Or if you live near me, it's going to come out three weeks early at your local Barnes & Noble and Books A Million. Because for some reason, my local ones don't care about release date. And uh, Night of the Living Mummy is scheduled to come out on, looks like, September... September 3rd, 2024. So we got two House of Shivers books this year. Um, and Goosebumps, ever since the show, has been pumping out some stuff. We have a new Goosebumps graphics coming out. That is, everybody's hyped for this because it's a fan-beloved book. And it's uh, illustrated and I think adapted and written by Maddie Gonzalez. And it's Goosebumps, the graphic novel, The Haunted Mask. And if you haven't seen the cover of this graphic novel i think by far it's one of my favorite covers i've seen come from goosebumps in the past few years uh, i'm totally excited to see this i think there was a four page preview that dropped recently um and the scheduled release date it looks like it's going to be september 3rd 2024 along with night of the living mummies release and i i know we have a lot to say about this because this might be the most hype goosebumps release of this year even though it's just an old story, but we're finally getting a comic book adaptation of it. Um, and I'm I'm stoked to see it as a massive haunted mask. And I want to hear what you and you all have to say about it. Anybody want to take the floor first about it? Well, I'll start because I have to hop off in a little bit here. But I'm I'm really excited for it. I think the art style is really cool. I really enjoy it. You know, a lot of people have been kind of not into the whole more cartoony art style that it has even though it's nowhere near as bad as the art styles for like horror at camp jelly jam or bomb will snow in a pasadena or any of those ones in the goosebumps graphics books those suck but this one actually attempts to it's cartoony but it works very well in the context of the story and as an animation fan and a cartoon fan i love that kind of art style so i think it works really well and i think from the comic the panels we've seen I think it looks really nice. I love the design of the haunted mask itself. I really think they did a good job designing it and kind of making it look like the Jacobus are, but also over exaggerating and more cartoonize or cartoonizing it, I guess. <laughs> and I, I just really like it. It just looks really cool. Yeah, and I, I will say this, you know, when you, when I think back to like the Jelly Jams and the Pasadenas and the Night of the Living Dummy adaptations, I, mean, I just get like vomit in the back of my throat a little bit but when i look at the art for this you know my, my only criticism with this is that i think the art style is fine like you said for what they're going for with the tone uh which is totally fine i think you could still have a light-hearted cartoony style but have a dark and serious toned story to go along with it but my biggest fear is the halloween atmosphere imbuing in this story that's going to be a sight to see. We're going to have to see how the panels deliver the story from page or even episode uh, adaptation from the 90s to the page here. Um, what I do love about the cover is the fact that we get to see the unloved one masks finally get an official cover release and see somebody's interpretation of them. And honestly, I'm stoked to see these on panel because I've always imagined what they look like in my head reading the book. And of course, watching the episode, you see the episode ones. But I'm, I'm curious to see what they do with these. And I'm hoping that 
maybe they can do stuff with this and maybe make a spinoff. Who knows? I think it'd be fun. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting too to add on to that. Like how every adaptation seems to do the unloved ones differently. Like the, the ones on the cover look nothing like the ones that are described in the book. They're doing, it seems like they're doing their own thing with them, which I really like as well. That each adaptation kind of does their own unique idea with the other unloved masks. Yeah, I, um, I think the one similar one, somebody pointed it out on Twitter, is like this blue one directly behind Carly Beth. Kind of looks like the the Hellraiser looking mask with the, mm -hmm. with the teeth and, and smile from the episode. Um, so yeah, I'm curious to see what can come out of this. Maybe they'll make a Haunted Mask 2 graphic, so I don't know. Um, BD and Soda, you have anything y'all want to add to that? Yeah, I was going to say... Um... I'm super excited for this because I did see the sneak previews of the uh, comic pages. Um, the first thing I got to say is I love the cover as well. Um, one of the biggest things I love is Carly Betts' design. Carly Betts' design on that cover looks dope. And the fact that she's holding the mask in front of her. And another thing that I enjoyed was that if you look at the unloved ones towards the bottom, they look very freaky. You got some insectoid-looking mask. You got some alien-looking ones. So it's just a very dope cover and I think embodies the book really well. Um, I will say, though, that although I do like the comic artwork, I, in a way, I feel like it's not as good as the cover was. I'm a little bit toned down. But the one thing I do really enjoy, mostly because I am a comic book and superhero fan, the mask looks a lot like Green Goblin. And it has a lot of homages to Green Goblin because one of the panels shows a kid's terrified expression in the reflection of these yellow eyes. And it looks just like what you see when you look at the Green Goblin's mask in the movies or even in the comics. And that's multi-layered because obviously the haunted mask is influencing Carly Beth and, you know, the Green Goblin mask influences, you know, their wielder. So it's very cool. I like it. Um, I think it works. Uh, there you go. Uh, my only thing would be that I do feel if it goes a little bit too cartoony, I think that the haunted mask is a good enough story that they can get away with it, but it would kind of take away from some of the darker more sinister undertones that the book had and again like completion has brought up the atmosphere to the book when you imagine it in real life is very dark sinister the full moon the clouds in the sky and the leaves rustling it's very ominous i don't know if they can replicate that with the artwork but i am still excited for it and i'm hyped and i love the fact that it's getting adapted because there was a big while that old stories were not getting adapted in goosebumps since we had the previous graphics and, you know, we had Are You Afraid of the Dark doing stuff like adapting episodes into books, Cutter's Treasure, Nightly Neighbors, stuff like that. So seeing old stories get brought back in a new fashion, that's super dope, and I always encourage it. And Goosebumps needs to do more graphics and more comic books. Stein, Scholastic, I'm looking at you. We need a Goosebumps anthology comic book, just like Creepshow does. This is our step. We're getting that artwork out. Make it happen. And if it does... I'm going to be the first one to review it because it'll be so fire. I'll be promoting it everywhere. Oh, totally. I totally think that Boom Studios, I maybe not IEW, but maybe like um, an image or a Boom Studios can pick up the Goosebumps IP and put out a monthly comic. I think that'll be a really cool addition. And we can have new content that way and not have to worry about making full books. You just make little short stories and throw them in there. Hmm. Or even um, totally do like... Yeah. Or even do more graphics adaptations of the OG 62 books. Like, Welcome to Dead yeah, House, yeah. a cool graphics adaptation. Or Say Cheese and Die, or some of those ones. Totally. I mean, if Haunted Mask sells well, which I think it will. Mm. I've seen a lot. You look at the pre-orders on this. I mean, they've been up for a while, and it's it's trending. So people are pre-ordering this, um, which is good. I think it's healthy. Uh, Bruce, you have anything you want to add before we shift the discussion? Well, also, before he goes, I got to hop off, so. Oh, okay. Thanks for thanks for coming on for as long as you did. We appreciate seeing you and hearing yeah, what you had sure. to say, man. Bye, right, Take care. All right, see you guys. Um, so what I think about the new graphics books, so it's interesting. I will say that I am not a huge fan of, like, comic books at all actually i don't want it to be rude here i just it's not my thing uh i like the spider-man movies like the original ones like that's like about it though as far as like comic book anything goes but i will say this this surprisingly works i don't know what it is but 
everything works for me. I really like the look of the Unloved Ones, especially. They look, everything's really cartoonish, I feel like. Uh, not in a rude sense, it just is. But everything just kind of works. My only gripe, and it's just so sad to see it, but, you know, it's something you gotta live with. Plus, Scholastic probably made, uh, I think it's a she who made this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, made her kind of try to make it look a little bit more like the new series, but the mask itself is just a little bit too cartoonish. I think that, you know, it kind of looks like a goblin. Uh, It looks better than the new show. Don't, uh, I will not doubt that at all. But I still wish it just would have been a little bit more scarier. Like, uh, it looks a little too, I don't know what it is. It's just the teeth with uh, the smile, the eyes. It just doesn't work with the haunted mask. I like how big the eyes are on Carly. It makes her look different, I guess. It uh, makes the art style more distinctive. But the haunted mask, I can't really say the same for. Besides that, though, I really like it. And I'm actually excited to see uh, how the rest of that goes. I don't think I'll buy this. Because, uh, once again, I'm just not a huge comic book fan. I don't even know how to read one, honestly. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm excited to see what else uh, pops up. Maybe there will be some new references, hopefully. Uh, maybe a camera pops up somewhere that looks like the old TV show camera. That'd be cool. Just something like that that's a little. Uh, we can search around for Easter eggs if they're available. If they're not, uh, I'm not going to be disappointed. Uh, but... I think this could really go somewhere. I don't know. And if this does well, uh, hopefully better than the original graphics, which sucked. I've read them before um, or tried to. I think that if this does well, uh, like Ultimate kind of said, I feel like this could spiral off into tons of different stories. Hopefully they don't uh, adapt the same ones they already did. If they did, that's fine. But I'm hoping just... No slappy kind of uh, attitude. I want to sound stupid here, but I think we've had a little bit of uh, a little bit enough with him. I feel like we need some more stuff like uh, what y'all said. Welcome to Dead House would be awesome. Say cheese and die. Anything possible, really. Heck, I live in your basement would be cool to see adapted. So yeah, that's what my thoughts are on that. Yeah, and um, great points by the way. Um, I think that. The release schedule for these, though, have me kind of, you know, lackluster about it, though. When we're when we're looking at the prospects of potential future of these, they're probably going to release one a year. And that's just 365 days between a graphic novel. If they want to do it right, um, they can just get a bunch of people that they think can are fans of the, the source material and want to do this justice. They could pick, like, Walking to Dead House, Stay Out of the Basement, maybe The Ghost Next Door, and try those three. Maybe Stay Cheese and Die as well, and run those out and try to space them out every few months. Because Arl Stein's not rewriting these, and I don't know if they're adding stuff to this. This is the whole perplexing mystery. Are we going to get an alternate take on Haunted Mask with Manny Gonzalez's version here? Are we going to get some self-insert stuff? Are we going to get some weird shenanigans that... We don't want to see. I don't know. Uh, but who knows? Manny Gonzalez, though, seems like a very nice person on Twitter, though. She seems like a fan of this. I don't think that she would steer the ship in a wrong way, though. But I don't, in a lot of ways, I think Goosebumps graphics coming out with this is a reaction to this. Are You Afraid of the Dark is coming out with, you know, graphic novels. And we can kind of just talk about Are You Afraid of the Dark in one go here. Uh, because Are You Afraid of the Dark, you know, has a book series. Uh, we have the tale of the grave mother and uh, uh, the the graphic novel, and both of these came out this past year. But recently, there was an announcement. I think let me pull this up on Abrams Books that uh, there's a paperback version of the tale of the grave mother releasing this September, and inside is going to be a preview of the second book that I'm assuming is coming out next year called the Tale of the Twisted Toy Maker, which is written by um 
Danielle Valentine, who also goes by Danielle Vega. She's like a horror suspense thriller writer. And uh, I'm curious to see what that story is about. It was at one point called Miss Mabel's Doll Emporium or something like that. So, <laughs> um, so I know y'all haven't read the Are You Afraid of the Dark stuff, the recent stuff. Um, but I, we have mentioned this in the past that healthy competition means a lot. I mean, even Stein is competing with himself with Slime Doesn't Pay, and he has his um, Blackstone publishing contract where he's making standalone books, and people are hoping that he's using unused Goosebumps titles to finally turn into books, like, or maybe put them in House of Shivers. Maybe the success of Goosebumps graphics can bring Haunted Mask Lives as book four, or maybe we can get Happy Holidays from Dead House, or we can get 43 Freakout Street, something like that. You know, some really cool titles that he's not used. Um, and I forgot to mention this, but yeah, he made this recently. So Stein is like kind of putting out three to four books a year. And we don't know the next Blackstone book. I'm assuming if there was going to be news, it's going to drop soon. And it'll probably release at the end of this year if he is making one. Um, but what do you all think about the Are You Afraid of the Dark coming back into the swing of things? You all think it's good? They also have a podcast, which is on Audible. Um, I think it's cool. And we've already kind of touched touched on this in previous podcasts but y'all have anything y'all want to add to it um i think that it's actually quite awesome i'm not the biggest are you afraid of the dark fan myself but uh, i do know back in the i think it came out in the late 80s if i'm not mistaken uh maybe i don't know early but 90s I knew, yeah sorry early 90s i knew that is it's an extremely important thing in the 90s uh, obviously it kind of birthed kids horror as we know it um especially anthology i'll say that and i also know that uh back in the day there was a massive book series i don't know how many books were in it but it was such a big property that they even wrote books uh kind of in the same style you know as stuff like this where you got different authors kind of coming in from time to time and uh, I think that's really cool how big it got. And it's kind of sad to see that it kind of faded into, I guess, obscurity over time. But now it's making a comeback. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what people think of the new book. I haven't seen any reviews on it, really, besides completionists. But if that uh, remains popular or if it becomes popular, you got that. There's like a new TV show. I think that it's really cool seeing this and kind of, I guess, Goosebumps already has been back, but it's kind of cool seeing both of these, like the two main competitors, risen up again. It's really interesting, in my opinion. They're way, both are way different than they used to be. Uh, Goosebumps is a little bit shifting towards its old roots, but they're still a bit different. Um, and it's kind of cool to see that they're evolving and they're still around to this day. It just shocks me. So, yeah. I, I don't know. That's all I have to say on it, really. BD, you have anything you want to add? Well, having read one of the books and hearing things about, like, Tale of the Grave Mother and some of the other ones, I think that the quality of these books easily rivals some of the best books in Goosebumps. Me, personally, uh, after reading Tale of the Restless House, that competes with some of the best Goosebumps books I've read. And, obviously, I've seen your review about Tale of the Grave Mother, Completionist. I've seen some other reviews about books, and I love the fact that they're dropping so many. You got cool ideas like Shimmering Shell, Mogul Monster, the hockey team, and now you got these new books coming out that are basically continuing that legacy. And I think it's dope um, because I'm looking for that golden era of kids' horror to come back where you had Goosebumps and you had all those knockoffs, Shivers, Dead Time Stories, Bone Chillers. You had all these knockoffs that were dropping, Spine Tinglers. I could only imagine being during that era and Ghost of Fear Street because you would have been saturated in content. And we've been dry for a long time. We just had Goosebumps and a couple other series. So are you afraid of the dark? Pushing Goosebumps, you know, buttons and trying to see what it can pump out is pretty dope and I like it. And I like the fact that they're kind of building off that competition with each other. Um, it's funny because when you look at adult horror, adult horror basically never has this problem. There's always a surplus of content coming out. But kids' horror and YA doesn't have as much. YA is getting more attention now, but kids' horror has kind of been in the back burner. So I'm, I'm happy to see it come back. And I'm going to be reading every book. I do own quite a bit of Are You Afraid of the Dark books. I will be buying the new ones. 
And I like the fact that, you know, Goosebumps is pumping out new content. Also, we forgot to mention, as a response to uh, the anthology you have over there, uh, Stein is pumping out Stein Tinglers. And Stein Tinglers are also oh, like yeah. Goosebumps stories. And he's pumping out a bunch of short stories. So you can see that he's trying to get more content out there, trying to make sure they don't fall behind. So I like this friendly competition because it ends up with more content for us. It's the same thing as like merchandise. The good thing about merchandise is once you put on more hype, you get more benefits for us as the fans. Same thing with books. We end up getting more content to absorb, and I feel like the new generation needs that. So I'm happy for it. Yeah, I mean, Stein Tingler <laughs> 3 comes out this later this year. It comes out on August 27th, uh, I think a week before um, Night of the Living Mummy and the Haunted Mask graphics. So Stein, yeah, he's still making short stories. We don't get tales to give you goosebumps. I've I've said this since the, the very first Stein Tingler's book. Why is he making these outside of goosebumps? Like bring back tales to give you goosebumps and make these goosebumps stories. What are y'all doing? I feel like Scholastic is missing a huge opportunity. And I feel like in a lot of ways they're kind of ruining the marketing of goosebumps because they can have way more content than just reusing old stories and graphics and putting out two books a year. I mean, that's why I think. Are You Afraid of the Dark is probably the coolest franchise right now because of the amount of content you have. You have graphic novels. You have a TV show that I don't know if they're getting a season four, but it seems like they are. Uh, there's possibilities for Paramount Plus to pick up a, a new anthology show. I mean, you have these books coming out. You have the podcast uh, on Audible that shares exclusive stories there. B, do you have anything you want to add? Oh, dude, I was going to say, I'm this close. I'm this close. The sucker punching Stein right in his face. I'm going to find his apartment. I'm going to sucker punch that man. Because he's making Stuff of Nightmares, an adult comic book series that reminds me so much of Creepshow when I see the covers, when I see the artwork. You know, he's making all this adult content. And I'm like, Stein, take that and put that into kids' horror, and you give us exactly what we need. So I agree with you that I think he's pumping his resources and his time into the wrong stuff because i know sorry monster blood I, I know you're watching out there maybe you're a fan of stuff of nightmares i would love that for kids horror make it into a monthly comic put in that same amount of time you got the artwork you got the resources just carry it over people will love that and it'll motivate goosebumps more because at the end of the day whether you want to agree to it or not chapter books are still popular but comic books Japanese manga and animation is taking over. That's been picking up in popularity for a long time. I'm a huge comic book and manga fan. The value goes up. The amount of adaptation you get goes up. If Stein is pumping out that content, it's going to build up hype for new fans, and it's going to keep adding new platforms for the series. So, Stein, if you're somewhere out there listening, please, bro, drop Happy Holidays from Dead House, and please take that stuff of Nightmares and turn it into some kids' horror series and pump out comics that way because um, that's what you need to be doing. No offense. Hey, you can use it to revive Nightmare Room or something and just make it into a Nightmare Room comic. I don't care. <laughs> whatever whatever you need to do. Bruce, uh, you have something you want to add? Yes. Uh, BD actually just made a great point about how he should make it uh, into like a kids' series because you can tell Stein is still trying to like reminisce about old series and books he's made because in these uh artworks well there's alternate versions at least they're making basically the same artworks as there were for old rl stein books just for an example uh and i think the latest uh stuff of nightmares issue uh sleigh ride there was an alternate cover with the silent night 2 book cover just with like different designs which is so like weird it's like you might as well try to make this like almost like a fear street thing or of course we would rather have it like goosebumps but just anything that's uh more like ya or kids horror would be awesome to see and you can tell he's even still like talking or i guess trying to represent that old stuff uh and people are buying it up they're like Oh yeah, Silent Night too. That's awesome. And then they buy it. And I don't know how many people actually read these, but probably quite a few. They're like, while thinking about it, 
Silent Night 2, uh, I don't know what's better, but they're probably thinking more about those old books or uh, his kids' horror IPs uh, more than the new ones, I guess, for uh, adults. But it's still, in my opinion, cool to see what he's doing lately. I think it's, like, better to see him doing uh, kids' stuff with these ideas, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, go ahead, BD, because I'm I'm going to add something, too. Yeah, I was also going to say, building off of that, because we're talking about adult horror for just a brief second, um, I'm going to throw out a bone to people out there. Um, You know, Stein, you know, he's been called, like, the Stephen King for kids' horror. Uh, I want to throw a bone out there. Hey, Stephen King, hey, Joe Hill, any of you authors out there, if you want to start tackling into kids' horror, please do so. Because not only would that pump out new content, you're going to put extra pressure on Stein, on Scholastic, on everybody to get their game up. Because let me tell you something. If Stephen King one day decided to go and do kids' horror, that shit would, I don't care how old Stein is, I don't care if he's in the hospital bed. He's going to pick up a pen, and he's going to start going straight to work, bro. It don't matter what it is. And on top of that, if you if you think that that's a far off stretch, I dare you to go read Creepshow the Taker. I started reading that novel, and it's very much in the vein of Goosebumps and YA horror and Fear Street. You get a lot of stuff like that. It's basically the Creepshow kind of ideas and format and stuff taken into YA and more PG setting. So they've made that transition before. Go, go all the way with it. Put that pressure on. Give us that content and try something new. And if you think Stephen King isn't capable of that, Shadyside Library just reviewed a book called Fairy Tale by Stephen King, which is a non-horror book. It's just pure fantasy, no horror, but it's still got that writing style of King. King, Joe Hill, all you authors out there, give a shot at kids' horror. See what you can do. Yeah, and I think I think that's a great point, too. Have, like, these famous authors or somewhat notable authors in this horror genre to stab at kids horror, you know, offer their hat in the ring. What I was going to say is perhaps, you know, back to the Stein thing is Stein, like at this point, if you wanted to make a kids horror comic series, you can revive nightmare room or you can make it goosebumps or make it totally something new, but make it and market it well and say like from the maker of goosebumps nightmare room comes a new vision of kids horror for rl stein and this is a new series for that or even if stein really wanted to him joan Maricha, and his wife jane they just put out a contract uh recently and made a movie called um rl stein zombie town if you want to take some of these lesser known rl stein stories and put them into the mainstream and like film or even have stein himself write a story to get made into a movie like when good ghouls go bad for example i mean this is and, and actually not go the pg route but make it pg-13 and get an audience for it give rl stein some you know maybe three films if he's lucky, you know, and try them out in theaters and see what happens when you take his source material seriously a little bit. Or you can let him just kind of, you know, be himself and be more humorous too. That's fine. I welcome that. But, you know, get, there, there should be more, I feel. You know, and a lot of people say, well, he's old. He's already given us a lot. That's fair too. Um, but if, we're, if he's still going to be pumping out content, I think he should stick to what he's famous for. And I'm, I don't mean disrespect to stuff and nightmares and stuff, but that's not what I'm interested in from him. And I don't think most of us aren't that interested in it. Bruce, you have something you want to add? Uh, I actually want to go back to what BD said, uh, just as an example. A little known author, well, actually pretty well-known author, Christopher Pike, back in the like late 80s, early 90s, wrote uh, adult horror and then later on, in like the mid to late 90s, wrote Spooksville, which is a kid's horror IP. Have that happen with Stephen King, for example, and that would be awesome. Spooksville is super beloved, and so is uh, his adult novels. So if that can work, Stephen King will work. Let's make that happen someday. Let's. Yeah, and um, <laughs> BD, you have something you want to add? Well, I was going to add to what both of you guys said. So first of all, Adding on to first with soda, just a quick point. Uh, the reason why King should also do it is because, my friend, you've never tried kids' horror. Stein has tried adult horror, 
and it's uh, not gone over so well. People don't really like his adult horror as much as they do his kids' horror. So as long as you try something new, you don't really know what's going to happen. And to build off what Completionist said, uh, there's some lost media out there in the world. And when I found out about this personally, my mind exploded, and I nearly cried for three days straight because I was like, why in this godforsaken world did this not become a thing? George Romero was going to make a Dead House movie. And if you read the script, it was supposed to be extra dark, extra sinister, with the Romero flair. He was taking the original story, expanding it, making it much more fearsome. And the fear was, oh, it's going to be too scary for kids. Kids aren't going to like it. Kids are soft. Let me tell you something, Scholastic. The internet exists. Do you know why creepypasta is so popular? Do you know why scary stories in the dark is so popular? It's because kids like to rebel. They like to rebel against their parents. They like to rebel against society. They like reading that darker stuff. They like getting that mixture. Kids are, in fact, so desensitized that going for scarier stuff will actually get their attention more. So if you wanted to go for something like Obviously not George Romero in this case, but if you want to take some other popular director or give a shot to taking, let's say, a Goosebump story and making it darker, making your own spin on it, and making that into a full-out movie like Zombie Town, do 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 Zombie Town, but make it better than Zombie Town. You know what I'm saying? Make it actually what it's supposed to be, what fans are looking for, and throw the IP out there. Give give it to big names and see what they can do because you may be scared at first. But big names get you more publicity, gets you more promotion, gets you more impact, and it offers up avenues for new stuff you can do. You build connections. You don't burn them. Great points. Great points. Um, I feel like I feel like we pretty much said everything we need to say about Goosebumps because I think a lot of us have had some frustrations recently. But these are just some ideas, Scholastic and Stein, if you're out watching. Um, Maybe take note of what your competition is doing a little bit and try to expand on it. Uh, maybe listen to our feedback. Um, but to keep the ball rolling, we're gonna. I'm gonna kind of speed through this because I know y'all probably don't care about this stuff as much as I do, getting this information out. Uh, but the first thing I want to bring up is that on the on the periphery, uh, we have a new Mike Ford book. Now, if you don't know who Mike Ford is, he was a ghostwriter on a famous Goosebumps knockoff series called Spine Tinglers. He wrote, I think, two to three books. I think he wrote Lights, Camera, Die in the Student Exchange from Memory, and I, he might have written another one. Uh, but he's also known for writing the Eerie Indiana books from back in the 90s, which is essentially like a Spooksville show that they made books for, and he wrote the books there. He also wrote a four-book series called Frightville that came out recently, back when the 2015-2018 Goosebumps movie era was around. But he has now kind of reinvented himself as like a Mary Downing Hawn type. And because he's a writer from one of my favorite knockoff series ever, Spine Tinglers, I've been buying his books. I, I bought The Lonely Ghost that came out recently. I haven't read it and reviewed it, but I, I do have it on my to-be-read list. And later this year, it looks like it's coming out on October 1st, 2024. We have a new Mike Ford book called The Headless Doll. Um, and we've already brought up there's um, the haunt, uh, the terrible toy maker coming out from Are You Afraid of the Dark for book two, come possibly in 2024, possibly in 2025, who knows? But we have a lot of doll stories uh, coming out recently or in the near future. And I and I want to segue this, but do y'all want to have, add anything about Mike Ford or curious about his work or anything? That's or, actually or? what you just said. That really shocks me that he wrote both of those because I've heard very positive things about both of those Spine Tinglers books, like really positive, like some of the best. So yeah, yeah, Lights Camera Die is kind of like if you took Arl Stein's Zombie Town and made it into a full book, kind of, um, which is really good. Um, and then Student Exchange I heard is a really good one too. I haven't read it yet, but I have it to, on my to be read. Too too bad. Uh, lights, camera, die is like eighty dollars on eBay. Man, I'm telling you, those later Spine Tinglers books, you gotta break out the money, man. Um, but to keep it to keep it on the uh, new knockoff series, a brand new knockoff series that came out recently in 2023, and it's called Fear Factory. I actually have a copy here. It's a and it's an asylum's book or asylum books. 
knockoff series. I'm sorry for the glare. It, there is definitely AI art on the cover. And the title, this first one is called Attack of the Living Slime. And the next book, we there's no confirmation on release date or anything. But as of now, it's called The Haunted Doll, which makes a third doll-centered story coming out in 2024. So 2024 for kids horror is going to be the year of the doll. Uh, but this new series um, did not get much publication. I think it was temporarily on Amazon, then it got pulled off. The only website you can buy this from is from Asylum Books. They have put out some parody books. I think they put out a co Cocaine Bear parody book, and it's you can find that on Amazon. Uh, there's a Winnie the Pooh one. I think it's Winnie the Pooh with Cocaine Bear mixed together. It's bizarre, but some of these books sound wild, and then you had this Fear Factory Goosebumps knockoff. So we're now we're back into this era where there's more overt Goosebumps ripoffs coming out again. And to go back to a previous one, we have Fright Vision, which is, this is just book 10. Uh, Culliver Krantz, the author of Fright Vision, he's been putting out these books for quite a few years. This is probably the longest running knockoff that's still currently going right now. Uh, he announced after, I think, book 12 of the series released back in March of 2023 that the next book, uh, the Curse Coin 4, which is just, this is the Curse Coin 3. Um, once that next book comes out, Fright Vision will be ending. So I think the final Fright Vision book will be coming out in 2024, sadly. I think the author just wants to move on and do other things. He's been doing this for quite a long time. But the fact that a knockoff series that was basically exclusively on Amazon uh, and there was like competitions and stuff, it had enough fan base to last this long, being as niche as it is. It's quite impressive, but I could tip my hat to Culver Krantz and uh, to the people out there trying to make content like this. But I think the two biggest series with the most prospect going on in kids' horror right now are Squall Charlton or Charlson's Terror Valley and Matt McCann's Monsterious. Now, these are probably the most likely to continue throughout 2024. Um, it looks like the release schedule has new books coming out every few months for these two series. And while I have not read uh, either a book from either one of these series, I definitely think that these have the most potential to possibly pick up a fan base and last longer than four books. Um, if you don't know anything about Terror Valley, it is a Amazon publishing physical book here. So you have to buy it through Amazon. Um, supposedly there is a new book coming out in next month in February 2024. And it's called This Way to Camp Blood. And there's no cover art yet, but the title is freaking awesome, okay? This Way to Camp Blood. And this is an obvious ripoff of Stay Out of the Basement, okay? You can just look at this cover and be like, yeah, <laughs> it's it's called You're Not My Sensei. So it might be kind of a parody type of thing. Bruce, you have something you want to add? Um, I'm actually hoping to read that Monsterious series uh, as well soon, hopefully. I don't know where to get it especially, but um, I actually even talked with the author, and he's super nice, so that even boosts my confidence in the series, I guess. So yeah, shout out to him. Yeah, they just recently came out with book four, The Beast of the Skull Rock, and I think um, they have a release date coming out for this book. Let me pull it up real quick. I think I pulled it up. Um, I had it pulled up. Let's see here. It's called Trapped in the Horror Dome, and it releases August 6, 2024. So, yeah, I mean, Monsterious is going to be on book number five. This is book number four. So they're on their fifth book. And y'all just saw the montage of new stuff that's coming out, and as slated... Um, are there any series that you're curious about? Um, are you curious about trying Fear Factory or Terror Terror Valley? Maybe Fright Vision, go back and see what the series was like. Or you want to try Monsterious? I know Bruce said he wants to try Monsterious. Um, the, the one I want to try the most is Terror Valley, because they're going to have books every two to three months. And I think this might put some release pressure in the subgenre a little bit, especially if you have an author putting out similar content. I'm hoping that kind of awakens Scholastic a little bit to want to, you know, pump out maybe two extra books a year, try to get to that point again. Um, but yeah, anybody want to add to that? 
Um, I think that all of that's really cool. Uh, like I said, I do want to read some of these series. I'm not sure about the AI one, because that might be written by, like, chat GPT. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> so, that was a terrible joke. So, I am hoping, though, that just by chance, all right, it's never going to happen. But, I mean, Goosebumps is kind of making its comeback. Are you afraid of the dark books are coming back? How about we get something else from the 90s to come back? Like, Ghosts of Fear Street. Or, I mean, I, I remember they did reprints for those. Dead Time Stories gets reprints sometimes. How about we get some new, like, Dead Time Stories books? Or, like, Shivers, even, for some reason. I, I think uh, the most he... likely, I think the most likely would be Dead Time Stories. I think A.G. Casco and the sisters, Anna and Gina, they probably would be interested if the money is there. You know, if they can get guaranteed work, yeah. I think they would do it. And, I mean, although it, I'd love to see the original authors of these series, like, writing them again, maybe they could do what Are You Afraid of the Dark is doing and just have some uh, new ones coming in. Uh, filling in these roles, you know, bone chillers could come back in from book 12 all the way to 23. All of those were ghost written. Well, not really. They were just put under Betsy Haynes' name. Uh, but if we had some of these series coming back, there would even be more competition in uh, kids horror. And although they didn't do too well in the 90s, sadly, you can tell by a lot of the prices nowadays. Uh, because of just how popular Goosebumps was, although it's still going to be the same way, they're not going to do as well as Goosebumps, I still think that that could raise more awareness, I guess, to uh, kids' horror, and even bring more fans to these old series, and maybe get more people to read them online, or try to get uh, copies of these old books, and heck, why not, if you're already releasing those, do what Goosebumps is doing, and uh, re-release and reprints these old books that were uh, made back in the day. I think that'd be really cool if uh, we could get some of these authors to do that. You know, the tragedy about behind Bone Chillers, right? Um, they had a TV show back in the day, but Disney owned the rights to the TV show, and they made, a, I think, a season and then they just canceled it. I mean, and I don't know if that's the reason why Bone Chillers had to end. And if you don't know, supposedly there's a lot of evidence that they were they were trying to make a new series with a new ghostwriter name and secretly release like slated and former Bone Chillers books under a new new name because I think there was probably some issue going on with Disney. And that just really worries me about some of these older IPs coming back. There might be some red tape involved with that. I don't know mm. with some of them. Bone Chillers, I think, probably doesn't have a strong likelihood of coming back. But I think out of all the old ones, Dead Time Stories would be the number one contender. They had a TV show not too long ago, about 10 years ago, right around the time Haunting Hour was out. Yeah, Nickelodeon. I it think. was on Nickelodeon. And while I don't think it found the success on that network like it was hoping, the books, I think, could come back. I think the books could come back. And I think that's more important. Yeah. But I would love to see, like, new series like Fear Factory or, you know, Fright Vision's only going to be 13 books, sadly. But, uh, like, Monsterious, Terror Valley, you know, Fear Factory. Let's let's get these books up to 25, 30 books. You know, you can support these new ones and see what they got to offer. Bring back Monster Street. Um, There's also a TV show that has potential to get books, which is Creeped Out. And Creeped Out's pretty popular right now, so... I'm hoping Creeped Out does really well because we could also get book adaptations or unique stories to that um, in book form. Creeped Out story is probably the most bizarre one. I think, it, wasn't it like one of the canceled shows at like post-COVID? Like, I think Netflix went through a bunch of their shows and like cut a bunch and it fell victim to that. And I don't think it deserved it. <laughs> I think Creeped Out was a very good show outlet. It was like a kid's version of Black Mirror but more in the Goosebumps vein of things, they made a huge mistake. They could be on, like, season five or six by now and making creep show-like content for kids. I'm telling you, 
I wish I wish Creeped Out was still around making content because I think that would put pressure on Goosebumps and Sony to do something to that, or maybe even Paramount Plus with Are You Afraid of the Dark, make an anthology to compete, or you know whatever. But Netflix, I, I, Netflix know. pulls like every show that they make that's actually good, and then just leaves all the garbage. Big Mouth season forty-two, you know it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, inversely, Disney. They had the Just Beyond comic series from Stein, and that was kind of like Goosebumps anthology style with each different issue. But Just Beyond, I think, hasn't put out a comic in like a few years, and it only lasted like one season on Disney Plus. And then after like a very short amount of time, Disney Plus nuked it off their website or off their streaming platform. So you can't even watch it anymore. You have to pirate it online. And I think that's just a travesty. Uh, to see this happen to shows, and that's what petrifies me with like mo- doing doing modern kids horror in television is that they go to streaming networks. There's no guarantee that you're going to be able to save these or archive these unless people pirate them. And nowadays, people are, go ahead and do that anyway. But it's just it's it's the principle behind it that just gets to me a little bit. Yeah, I agree there. You know. A lot of a, a lot of me wishes it was still kind of like 2010, 2011 era, where you had Haunting Hour. And if I can go back in time, and if I had, if I was the same age I am now, I would tell all these execs or write to them. I'm like, bring back Goosebumps, like put Goosebumps back on, like revive it and may, maybe dude. remake it. That would have been the time to do it. Haunting um, Hour, when that show came, dude, I used to get, I used to be babysitted by my father. I would be in his apartment, I have nothing to do. I'd be watching. Every single Haunting Hour episode that came out weekly, I thought it was the dopest show. All my friends watched it. I was just a peak era. And they had so much opportunity that got lost that I wish, I just keep wishing we can reverse time and go back to that golden age. So I'm hoping that everything gets back at least to normal and we can get all these series back up. Because I even had a personal heartbreak because I was so upset that Frightland, the book series, got basically the four book treatment because R.H. Grimley managed to get Tim Jacobus to make the cover of the first book, uh, the bog, uh, like the big, Bigfoot or Bog Creek or whatever, Wild Man of Shaggy Creek, I think. Um, you had all these unique ideas and it felt like, I really felt like it was going to embody the goosebump spirit. And then you had that title Once Upon a Slime and since then we haven't gotten anything from that. So that unfortunately got cut down. That hurt. So even though the market is very competitive, I'm hoping that by some miracle, these authors and producers of shows can get a chance. And that kind of makes me question, do you feel like at one point, especially during the height of the knockoffs between 95 to 98, do you feel like back then the market was kind of oversaturated and that probably led to the downfall of the original 62 in some way too? Because if you look at the amount of just kids horror stuff coming out at the time yes it's good for us kids horror enthusiasts looking back on it but when i when i sit down and think about you know how that would have done for the market i feel like if there's too much kids are too overstimulated and they get tired of something it get it gets its 15 minutes of fame with them and then they move on to something else that they find cooler like manga or anime or something but i feel like maybe these days in order to keep this new bubble that we're in more healthy is that there should be select amount of series that get made so it's just not oversaturating the market. Um, And I think it's kind of healthy to have those Amazon exclusive ones, but I also think it's healthy to be promoting more out in the bookstores too. It's not good just to see goosebumps on the shelves because that only shows them one avenue. Um, And I think that having more competition there would be better uh, and I, it, will, it was kind of like that around the 2015 bubble that burst around Goosebumps 2 second movie. And then we got the aftermath and the, you know, the dying days of Slappy World until we got this new Goosebumps 2023 show. Um, but I just want to see it survive and be healthy. And I don't want just too much competition out there, if that makes any sense. Well, I was going to say, too, that I think I think back during that era, a big problem was that it was very oversaturated, but it was during the prime of Goosebumps. So you also had a lot of readers going like, oh, that's just another Goosebumps knockoff. That's a Goosebumps knockoff. It's not Goosebumps. It's not the original. It's not that. But now we've had this basically empty chasm 
of Goosebumps in terms of quality for a while. And that's what's allowed series like Are You Afraid of the Dark to slowly start slipping back in there, these other shows to start getting attention. So I think in a way, this is probably better for Goosebumps knockoffs and competitors because there's finally that open market, that need that people are like, no, no, no. We need that old school quality. We need that good quality content to come back. Because I feel like back in the day, it was probably so oversaturated because all the authors were like, come on, we got to get at least one hit. We got to get at least one book that's going to be as popular as Stein right now. And now the tables have turned and Stein's like, I really got to put in that effort to make sure these guys aren't surpassing me. So it's kind of crazy how it took a 180 as the years went on. That's a great observation, by the way. I never really thought of it like that. Um, Bruce, do you have anything you want to add on? Uh, I actually have something to say about this, actually. So, back in, I'm going to think, I, I okay, sorry. <laughs> in, like, mid-1994, I think the first knockoff series, by the way, these are all very subjectively knockoffs. They have very similar things uh, that probably took inspiration. There's also very uh, blatant ones like Shivers, but I think what was like the first Goosebumps knockoff was Bone Chillers, which came out basically even before Goosebumps got very popular. Um, They'll took inspiration. I'm not going to doubt that. Um, But Soon enough, you would see, you know, Fear Street trying to aim at that child market with Ghost of Fear Street. Uh, you had all these other things like Dead Time Stories and Shivers, which basically were just goosebumps. Um, again, uh, Christopher Pike and other other uh, authors who did horror were trying to throw their share at it. But yeah, you had all of this stuff going around while. Goosebumps was just pumping out books constantly, uh, whether it was Stein writing or not. Uh, you had Tales coming out. You had Triple Headers, original series, uh, Give Yourself books. There was so much Goosebumps coming out that not only was Goosebumps oversaturating the kids' horror stuff, but add on top of that, all these other series is trying to pump out stuff. Uh, especially ones like Shivers, which got like 30-something books in within a couple of years. That's how you know uh, things have gotten too big and too grand, I guess. Um, which, although cool for us, like you said, uh, not good for the market. But now, uh, like we know, Goosebumps is getting barely, what, five books a year at the most? That And that's pushing it. I think it's less than that. If we have more uh, of these different series that are similar to Goosebumps, or it can be a knockoff if it has to. Um, if we have these, I don't think it'll be as bad as what I'm trying to get at. Like, I don't think that um, we'll have that same catastrophic disaster that kind of happened in the mid to late 90s there with all the series all trying to compete at once and just... Almost every single one, especially in the later parts of the 90s, were just all failing extremely bad, ending all the series. Uh, although you could say they tried to cash in on Goosebumps, some of these went even into like the Series 2000 territory, you know, like late 1998 even. So... You know, it's kind of hard to say, but I feel like it would be a lot better now with how calm it's gotten. Uh, I think that it's a little bit too calm, but if things go back to how it was, that, yeah, definitely don't do that. But if it's, like, right now, I feel like if we had a bunch of other series going, like, we already do, kind of. Yeah, I think it works. I mean, I don't think it'll be oversaturated, especially with these, like, Amazon-exclusive books. I think we're fine, honestly. I don't think yeah, there's any... Yeah, so, like, right. so my thought process would be, like, if you're a fan of Goosebumps or, like, anthology kids horror, you can still get your Goosebumps fix with two or three books a year, but you can also go to the other series, like Fear Factory or Terror or Terror Valley or Monsterious, and they're probably going to put out three to four to five books a year, or maybe even more, because the authors are younger and they're able to write more with less projects to do. You can get your 12 kids horror books a year fix 
by going to those other series. And it's like, you've made a good point. As long as it stays kind of where it is now, and we're getting books pretty much every month from maybe different series here and there, that helps the release schedules out. That helps to keep it more organized. Imagine if you had like 10 series, like back in the nineties, all dropping books in August and you have to go buy all 10 at once. That would be a nightmare. <laughs> Your wallets would be drained, especially today's prices. What is it? Six, $7 a book. That's 70 bucks right there, just on 10 series. And let, so, let's just like, let's take this for example, too, not to drag this on, but uh, let's just say in the last like bits of these like knockoffs, let's just call them, you know, we have like, let's just take all of these. They're all very rare. Fairy Tale from Dead Time Stories, Horror Hotel Part 1 and 2 from Ghosts of Fear Street, uh, Killer Clown of Kings County. Uh, all that stuff, Weirdo Waldo's Wax Museum. Let's take every single one of those. Add on top of that, we have like Slappy's Nightmare uh, and all these other uh, Goosebumps books coming out at the time. It's a disaster. Which one are you going to get? There are so many coming out. And this was in a phase where kids were growing out of Goosebumps. So that's what we kind of want to drift away from and just keep it calm like what it is now, but maybe just get a few more here and there. Like that's kind of what I'm at right now. And and what I, what I think is going to happen if, if they really wanted to do something, all that would happen is classic Mike coach Stein and say, Hey, do you mind writing one or two more a year so we can keep up with these other guys? But I don't think it's ever going to go past that, but we are in a bubble after all. I mean, th we are in a bubble. We're starting to see, all these new series come out, and hopefully they can succeed. I, I hope they go on 20-plus books. Like I'm, I'm proud of them if they can do that. I'll support the little guy before I support big R.L. Stein, even though I love R.L. Stein and I love Goosebumps. I'm rooting for these little guys because if they succeed, it's going to make Goosebumps be like, okay, well, now we got to do something, okay? So, and then change will happen. And then maybe, it, you know, I hate to see it or hate hate to prophesize this, but... At some point, if the bubble pops, Goosebumps is going to be back to being the fail safe of kids' horror again, and we're going to have to consolidate everything and everything that we're looking forward to this one IP again. I don't want that. I think the hobby right now is healthier and the healthiest it's been in maybe since 2015, 2016, which is good. And, I, and I'm excited to see what comes out in the future. 2024 looks very, very promising for kids' horror. Yeah, just to put, a, I guess, like a bow a little bow on the gift. I was just going to say that I think it is um, good because even if you think about, you know, what prime goosebumps was, it was like this hurricane, this monster that nobody could stop. Because as Bruce brought up, Ghost of Fear Street, a series tied to Arl Stein's own name and Fear Street, got basically train wrecked by goosebumps. It could not keep up. It quickly got taken down after a while. And even a pilot episode quickly failed as a replacement for goosebumps. But there is a saying that amongst curses come blessings. And the same way that the Goosebumps TV show ended, we ended up getting Haunting Hour filling up its place. And like you brought up, this could basically be a repeat of the Golden Era. We're going to be getting a lot more books, a lot more content. And worst case, if this bubble does pop, that monster is just going to get Frankensteined again. And we're going to get Goosebumps back to what it used to be, which, although it's not ideal... I still think it is better than nothing at all. And uh, just to put it out there, Stein, you are getting up in age. If you want to hand it off to any new writers, go ahead and feel free to do so. Hell, you got some candidates over here. Hey, hey, you know, reach out to us, by the way. All right. Yeah, I feel like we said a lot of good things for this episode, y'all. Y'all feel a good stopping here? Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. So that was our discussion podcast. We thought we'd give this a shot, and I think it went very well. Please give us feedback down in the comment section of this video. Please go sub up all the panelists on the Goose Junkies podcast. I'll have all their information down in the description and in the link of this video. Uh, let us know if you're excited for any of these series coming out. Um, what's your new favorite kids horror series currently on the market? Is it Goosebumps House of Shivers? Is it Are You Afraid of the Dark? Is it Fear Factory of all books? I'm dying. We're all dying to know this. And do you think that the kids' horror bubble that we're currently in is healthy? And do you want to see it thrive? And do you want to go support other series outside of Goosebumps? We all encourage it, and we hope you do so. Until next time, take care. Peace. Have a good night.